Hello everyone and welcome to Archeo Viking. Today I'm starting a seven video series on the origins of modern East Asia. I am doing this because it is an incredibly interesting historical topic to study and because this region of the world and this period of time in this region of the world is often overlooked by both historians who are not specialists in either East Asia or the origins of modern East Asia, as well as being overlooked by the general public in general, uh, both of which overlook it in favor of the origins of modern, of the modern Middle East and modern Europe, which it, of course comes as a detriment to the study of world history overall, because many of the things that we use in our modern life actually have their origins in East Asia. So with that in mind, the, sub the, first, the subject of the first video of the series is the Ming Dynasty, uh, as it went from a dragon of the East to a troubled empire, which is a tale of how the Ming Dynasty brought China into the modern era. So when we hear the word or the name China, our modern minds immediately bring us to the modern country, uh, the modern communist country of China, which of course is very valid. It's what many of us, um, those of us who are millennials in our 30s or older, or our parents um, and our grandparents, and of course the generations after us, it's what we all know. And so, therefore, it's a very valid way of, it's very valid to think of China in this way. However, looking at the modern country of communist China as it is now often overlooks the how modern China got this way. Because, uh, because for much of its history, China was actually half its size, and actually also for a good chunk of its history, is it was very much larger. And so that's the purpose of this video is to look at the context and the background for how modern China was created. Uh, and so to do that, we need to look at the Ming Dynasty. But before we can look at the Ming Dynasty, we have to look at how the Ming Dynasty came into being. And to do that, we need to look at the fall of the Mongol Yuan Dynasty, or the Mongol Empire. So the Mongol Yuan Dynasty was the easternmost section of the four semi-independent Hanates of the Mongol Empire. And I say semi-independent because they were all part of the Mongol Empire, and all of them still answered to the Mongol, uh, the primary Mongol Han. Um, some of them to a lesser degree than others, but still. Uh, and it was also the largest of the four Mongol Hanates, uh, encompassing, of course, all of China, but also all of Mongolia, parts of Russia, um, all of the modern Korean Peninsula, uh, where the modern countries of South and North Korea exist, uh, parts of Burma or modern-day Myanmar and Thailand, as well as uh, in Cambodia, as well as parts of Vietnam and all of Tibet. Uh, and it, this, the Yuan Dynasty was officially founded in 1270 CE by the Mongol Great Han, Kublai Han. And for, for generally most of its 100 years of history, it was a relatively stable and powerful empire. However, as with many empires, uh, in fact all empires, it began to decline. Uh, and this was due to a variety of natural disasters. One, unseasonably hot and dry, as well as unse uh, uh, sorry, one, unseasonably hot and dry summers, as well as unseasonably cold uh, and wet uh, winters. Uh, impacted the growing of crops, uh, particularly in the southern regions. Of, well, in terms of summers, the summers impacted the southern regions and the winters impacted the northern regions, um, therefore causing, uh, the, in, the, it impacted the crop growing, the farming, and therefore causing famine. Now, I, I do want to point out that this is a, a, a um, 
a picture about famine in uh, China in the 1800s, uh, but it still gets point across. And this famine was exacerbated by the uncharacter uncharacteristically large floodings of the various rivers, which are which already flooded annually, um, such as the Yellow and the Huanghe uh, and the Yangtze rivers, which further destroyed more cropland that was already being impacted by the famine, uh, as well as also allowed for waterborne diseases to be spread. And these, the famine and the destruction from the floods, were themselves further impacted by inflation caused by overtaxation of the various impacted regions. Meaning that, one, the inflation meant that the Yuan Mongol government could not adequately um, alleviate the destruction caused by the famines and the flooding, uh, as well as they could not alleviate, uh, they could not, uh, how to put this, uh, essentially they could not, they could not repair any of the damage, they could not properly provide food for their subjects, uh, as well as they could not properly fund much of their military, in fact, um, or any public works. On top of the fact that the flooding actually destroyed the Grand Canal which was one of the primary ways to transport food north uh, to the less fertile northern regions of China from the more fertile southern regions of China. And so because of this, much of the Chinese populace, as well as the Yuan bureaucrats and the Yuan and Chinese generals, began to believe that essentially the heavens or the gods, uh, they're not, of course, not mutually exclusive, had rescinded the mandate of heaven. Uh, for those of you who haven't watched my other uh, videos about Chinese history, the mandate of heaven is the concept uh, that is generally uniquely Chinese, but is also seen in other countries impacted uh, and influenced by China, like the Korean, uh, like the Korean countries, uh, Japan. Uh, Vietnam, etc. Uh, and it's the idea that the gods and heaven are the ones who decide who essentially gets to become emperor and create their own dynasty. Uh, but it's all predicated on the uh, on the idea and the conditions that the emperor and his dynasty and his succeeding emperors would be virtuous rulers and would be attentive rulers. Uh, and this is all based off of the Confucian idea of um, of how a family works, where there is a strict hierarchy with the uh, either the emperor being the head of the state uh, and everyone going down, all the officials going down, or the father being the head of the family. And it's the role of the emperor and the father to care for properly and to protect their nation and their family. And this includes, you know, providing food, uh, protection from outside forces, etc., etc. But this Confucian idea, this mandate of heaven, also means that if the father is no longer virtuous or the emperor is no longer virtuous, uh, that the family members, the lower family members or the lower members of the empire are no longer obligated to acknowledge or to listen to the slash father slash emperor. And how this came into play when it came to dynasties is the mandate of heaven would be viewed to have been rescinded by heaven and by the gods when if there was, say, events like, well, I don't know, large-scale famines and the large-scale flooding that destroyed things and, you know, disease and such. And so when these natural disasters would show up and would be, and happen in uh, not only uh, large frequencies, but also extended periods of times, oftentimes, in fact, this is how many dynasties in China fell, uh, that would give the general populace the idea that the mandate of heaven had been rescinded. 
And of course, that is what happened. And so because of this, many rebel groups began to pop up uh, throughout the Yuan Dynasty, specifically in the southern part of China. Uh, one of these groups, sorry, two of these groups were the Red Turbans, uh, known, called that for the very obvious red turbans that they wore on their heads, as well as the White Lotus Society. Uh, both of these organizations, uh, one, they were allied together. They were not mutually exclusive at all. They worked together uh, to uh, to launch guerrilla warfare against the Yuan Dynasty's military all the time. Uh, but they were both uh, millenarian or apocalyptic uh, cults, where the idea is, you know, again, based off of that mandate of heaven, that essentially the heavens no longer wanted the Mongols to rule China, and so the time was nigh for the Chinese to take their country back. And at the backdrop of these of these rebel groups forming, uh, they began to form really around 13, or the 1340s CE uh, and 1350 CE. Uh, and at the backdrop of these groups being founded arose one specific individual, Zhu Yuan, uh, Yuan Zhang, uh, who, was, uh, who originally starred his life as a Buddhist monk. Uh, however, as the Buddhist temple began to uh, lose funding from the Yuan dynasty, which had actually uh, were patrons of the Buddhist arts, as well as the fact that the temple... Uh, all the monks in the temple began to starve from the famine and lack of food. Zhu, Zhu, uh, Zhu Yuan Zhang uh, left his monkhood uh, and eventually joined with the Red Turbans, uh, first as a general lower soldier and then eventually rising through the ranks as its leader. Uh, and with this, he eventually gathered many of the ver of the Red Turban bands together into a rather large, cohesive, well-trained army. And he marched and laid siege to the city of Nanjing, taking it uh, in the 1350s and making it his capital. Uh, afterwards, it, there was essentially afterwards his success began to make various other rebel groups who had once allied with him jealous. Uh, one specific group was the uh, rebel army under Xin Yo Liang, and so as a result of this internal conflict, Zhu Zhuan Zhang challenged Xin Yu uh, Liang uh, in battle and defeated Xin uh, and defeated General Xin at the Battle of Lake Poyang, as you can see here. And one of the ways that he actually won this is incredibly fascinating and also an incredibly common tactic uh, throughout the world, but also in China, uh, was Zhu Zhuanzhong utilized heavily uh, fire ships, i.e. ships that had uh, timber, uh, large amounts of timber piled on, uh, and then lit it on fire, and so you would have these huge hulking <laughs> ships of covered in flame coming into your naval ranks and just causing uh, causing all kinds of brutal devastation and havoc. Therefore, uh, winning Zhu Zhuanzhong uh, the battle uh, and ending his last, essentially giving him control of all of the, or at least most of the rebel groups in southern China and really in China overall. And so with his now increased army uh, in 16, is sorry, 16, 1368, Zhu Zhuanzhong marched north to the Mongolian capital of Dadu, modern-day Beijing, laid siege to it, and took it for himself. Uh, and it was also here that he... Uh, once he took the city, he began to uh, sack it uh, because he he had turned Nanjing into his capital. He no longer wanted anything to do with Dadu, and so he began to sack it and burn it. And in the process, many of the technological advancements that the Yuan Dynasty had cultivated, we're talking all kinds of um, automated 
uh, uh, mechanisms and automatons. And no, let me pause there. Not like literal like Atlantis stuff or like um, like you say, you see in uh, Terminator or iRobot or any other kinds of things. Uh, these were very rudimentary mechanisms that would be like roughly would be not quite as advanced as say a modern uh you know cuckoo clock i mean it, it would be roughly around that but that was advanced back then so i want to make that clear that was still ridiculously advanced but uh Zhu Zhu and Zhang, seeing these uh mechanized automatons and these other technological advancements these um mechanical clocks all kinds of things he viewed them as essentially the decadence of the mongol empire uh the you know the unnecessary decadence for that matter uh he was still a buddhist monk at heart um and so he set fire and ordered all of the uh technological advancements in dadu destroyed and with that with the destruction of dadu he finally took all of china uh back from the yuan dynasty and declared and created the Ming Dynasty. So now we go into Zhu Zhuangzhong as the reign of the first Mon of the first Ming Emperor. Uh, upon declaring the Ming Dynasty, Zhu Zhuangzhong took the royal title of Hong Wu, making himself the Hong Wu Emperor, uh, and he reigned from 1368, uh, sorry, 1368 to 1398 CE. And during his reign, he took the time to uh, repair the walls that he had damaged in his siege of Nanjing. In fact, here's a set, modern it, it, here's a modern picture of one of the sections of the wall that he uh, both repaired and added to Nanjing. He also took the time to uh, create a new law code, uh, the Da Ming Lu law code, which was based off of the earlier Song and Tang dynasty law codes, um, therefore creating a much more stable uh, government infrastructure. And of course, this was all based off of Confucianism, that because Confucianism throughout all of the Chinese dynasties, even the Mongol Yuan dynasty, was the backbone of the Chinese uh, of the Chinese uh, not aristocracy uh, bureaucracy of the Chinese bureaucracy. He also was a great patron of education. He built many imperial universities, like this one here in uh, modern day Beijing. Uh, emphasizing the importance of things like uh, mathematics, uh, writing, uh, as well as the Confucian classics. The, the Confucian classics were always an important keystone of Chinese uh, higher education, as well as, uh, as well as military studies as well, including archery and, uh, and horse, uh, horsemanship uh, and, and swordsmanship and things like that. Um, Essentially, he, he understood that education was the backbone of any, imp of any stable, powerful empire, and he understood that in order to have competent <laughs> generals and uh, government bureaucrats, you need to have them well-educated. He was also uh, relatively lenient on uh, most religions in China. Of course, he... He allowed Buddhism and Taoism to continue existing, uh, but he also was uh, essentially a patron of Islam. Uh, in fact, he constructed the Jinju uh, the Jinju Mosque that you see here that still stands to this day. However, it's also important to note, despite his patron of educate, his being a patron of education and his reforms to the Ming government to make the Chinese government much more stable, uh, as well as his patron of religions, uh, patronism of religions such as Buddhism and Islam, he was also an incredibly strict ruler. In fact, most crimes were involved either mutilation or death. Uh, like beheadings and uh, the very well-known uh, a thousand cuts execution method, where essentially you're strapped to either a wall or a pole uh, 
and you know your a thousand cuts are put all over your body until you bleed out horribly. He also was incredibly strict and mistrusting of his bureaucracy, specifically the eunuchs. Eunuchs, as I've talked about before, individuals who have their uh, lower extremities, uh, their their uh, private areas, uh, uh, cut off um, completely as a way to essentially trust that they won't sleep with the royal, any female members of the royal family, and to essentially to make them trustworthy. But of course, this often meant that the eunuchs became one of the most powerful, in, in many cases, who is, is in the late Han Dynasty, the most powerful entities in an empire. Well, Hong Wu, understanding history, uh, wanted to completely avoid that. So he, in order to check the power of the eunuchs, as well as to check the power of any other bureaucrats that he didn't trust, he created the so-called embroidered uniform guard, which was his secret police. And of course, you can imagine what this day is secret police would do. They would, uh, many a people, many a bureaucrats, many a eunuch, etc., uh, many a general that he eventually didn't trust were often hunted down and executed by his secret police right here. He also uh, initiated uh, several large-scale campaigns in the south of China, where specifically these were campaigns to deal with the last Mongol loyalists uh, in the a, a region of modern-day China known as Yunnan. And these were conducted between 1381 and 1382, uh, and they were incredibly swift and brutal conquests. Uh, and many of the individuals he brought with him, many of the individuals that were participated in the, on the other side in the Mongol loyalist part of the campaign uh, were captured and brought back and turned into eunuchs themselves. One individual we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, he also, during this time, led military campaigns to conquer the region known as Manchuria, which is this part of modern-day China that you see right here. He was also, he, during this time, uh, during his campaigns, uh, and during his reign, China also began to face uh, increased raids uh, from a group, a type of pirate known as the Wako Pirates. The Wako Pirates were, on paper, <laughs> on paper the Wako Pirates were Japanese pirates uh, originating from Japan. However, it's important to note, while Japanese pirates certainly, while Japanese citizens were certainly part of the Wako, uh, uh, most of the Wako pirates were actually from China or Korea. Um, oh, that's another important thing. During the Hongwu's reign, he essentially initiated a tributary relationship uh, with Korea, i.e. Korea, uh, the Korean Kingdom of Joseon was China's tributary state. So while Korea was in a sense um, was in a sense uh, independent, it still had to answer to China. And so uh, which is important because so when the Wako raids began to initiate or began to ramp up uh, the northeast part of China and the all of the southern coasts of Korea began to be the most heavily impacted. And so in response, the Hong Wu Emperor sent emissaries to the uh, Ashikage Shogunate of Japan, where these Wako pirates originated from, and demanded that the Ashikaga Shogunate stop the Wako pirates. Uh, but the Waka, but the Ashikaga Shogunate said, "Well, we can't control what they do. You know, it's it's the like you have you can do it better than we can, uh, because of course at the time, Ming China is with much of China's history was far more powerful than Japan. But the Hongwu Emperor didn't like this answer from the Ashikaga Shogunate. You know, how dare this uh, this country that for like." Korea had for, for centuries had been a tributary state to China, how dare this tributary state tell them no? <laughs> so in response, 
uh, the Hongwu Emperor cut off all outside trade with the exception of uh, the ports of Guangzhou, modern-day Canton, and uh, the courts of Fujian, and a couple others, but generally foreign trade was completely cut off. Which, which would eventually change, and that brings us to the the reigns of the Jianwen, uh, the Jianwen, and the Yongle emperors. The Jianwen emperor reigning from thirteen ninety eight to fourteen o two C E, and the Yongle emperor reigning from fourteen o two to fourteen twenty one C E. So. Eventually, unsurprisingly, the Hongwu Emperor would die of old age. And he, when he died, he, like anyone would expect, appointed his eldest son to be his heir. However, his eldest son died before Hongwu died. So, when Hongwu died, uh, the royal council... Um, came together and after some deliberation decided the next firstborn son uh, would be uh, so essentially the idea is uh, the throne must pass from the firstborn son to firstborn son so all, all of Hong Wu's other sons didn't count because they were no longer firstborn sons however the firstborn son of Hong Wu's firstborn son i.e. the oldest grandchild John Wen Emperor was chosen, and he was able to rule uh, from uh, for th for four years uh, from 1398 to 1402. However, the next oldest son, uh, Yongle Emperor, was furious because. The, for one, so so let's let's give some background. So Zhu Di, the Young Le Emperor, the eventual Young Le Emperor, was one of Hong Wu's best generals. He led many campaigns against uh, in the south of Yunnan, as well as against the Mongols uh, and in Manchuria. And so he was a battle hardened veteran. However, Jian Wen was. Uh, in his late teens, early 20s, and was relatively inexperienced. So, Zhu Di, the next eldest son of Hong Wu, of Zhu Zhuanzhong, felt that he was, in fact, the best choice for the throne of the emperor. And when he was passed over for the eldest son of his older brother, all bets were off. And he Waited a f for a few years again. Uh, he waited until 1402. Well, he let me rephrase that. He didn't wait uh, until 1402. He waited a couple of years uh, and then began a civil war. Um, and really, I should correct myself. I said a couple of years. Uh, it was more like a year. But uh, from uh, 1399 to 1402, he waged a civil war against his uh, against his nephew, and eventually, because he was much more a much more skilled tactician and had a lot of battle experience, he won out and he took the throne for himself, declaring himself the Yongle Emperor. And of course, it, the campaign in which he won the Civil War was the Jingnan Campaign. And so, once he became the Yongle Emperor. He be, he too like his uh, like his father began to uh, began to uh, create some reforms. First, he rebuilt and strengthened the Grand Canal, uh, which you can see here, which it goes from all the way north China to all the way to the southernmost point of China, which allowed for the much easier. Uh, transportation and the much quicker transportation of grain and other food items from the uh, breadbasket of China, the southern region of China, such as Hangzhou, to the northern regions of China, which were less fertile and therefore needed more imported food. He also finished his father's mausoleum, the Mi Jiaoling, which his father had begun during his reign, but had not been able to complete. 
And of course, the most famous um, act of the Young White Emperor's reign was the creation of the Forbidden City, which is the innermost part of the modern day city of Beijing. And so with the creation of the Forbidden City, Young White Emperor created his new capital. Uh, so therefore, Beijing became the permanent capital for the Ming Dynasty and succeeding dynasties. He also dedicated a number of Taoist and Buddhist temples. Uh, one such example is the Taoist temple. Uh, it is multiple Taoist temples dedicated to the god Zhuang Yu, uh, Zhuang Wu, uh, as well as other Buddhist temples to Lama Buddhism, uh, Tibetan Buddhism that you see here. And, like his father, he was a patron of Islam as well, and built multiple mosques, like the one you see here. And he began the construction of the Porcelain Pagoda, which he was not able to complete. His uh, One of his sons would eventually complete the Zhuan uh, Day Emperor. And during his reign... He began to implement uh, even more Confucian reforms, uh, with the focus being on Confucian values, like you see here. He also commissioned the Yongle Encyclopedia, which was the before uh, the uh, before Wikipedia <laughs> was actually the most comprehensive encyclopedia in the history of the world. And, of course, like his father, uh, he conducted quite a few military campaigns. He conducted campaigns against the Mongols, uh, with the first campaign in 1409 being a defeat, but the rest of his campaigns he led personally, uh, with them being some complete successes. He also initiated the conquest of Vietnam, marching south and conquering the Da Viet Kingdom of Vietnam. Uh, Southern Vietnam was called Champa, and he quite uh, didn't quite conquer it. And one of his most impactful reforms that he uh, that he implemented in his reign was the ending of Ming isolationism and the creation of seven uh, treasure fleets uh, led by his best admiral, in fact, one of his best generals overall, Zheng He. Zheng He being a general who, being a Mongol from Yunnan, uh, who had been captured in the Yunnan campaign and had been castrated, made a eunuch, uh, in order for him to be a much more trustworthy general and bureaucrat. And he grew up with, he was essentially given to Hu Zhu Di as one of his uh, one of his attendants, and they became fast friends, and, uh, and Zhang He quickly became one of Zhu Di's best generals. And so, uh, eventually in 1405, Yang Le decided it was time to reopen Ming China to the world, and he sent these treasure fleets out. Now, I've already done a in-depth video on Zhang He's treasure fleets, which I will include in the iCard. Uh, but it is important to note that this was one of the reforms that Zheng He implemented, and it was actually uh, what it was actually one of the building blocks that allowed uh, the Euro eventual Europeans from, let's say, Portugal, like Vasco da Gama, to so easily uh, get a foothold in the region because the stability that Zheng He's fleet, because it was a military fleet, provided to the region and the various bases that he provided, as well as the uh, openness of trade, allow was what allowed for that to happen. However, he he too, of course, he, um, Young Le Emperor, of course, would also eventually fall. Uh, Young Le Emperor died in. 1424, uh, and he in his throne was first inherited by his eldest son, the Hongxi Emperor, on the left, 
but his eldest son died a year later in 1425 for his throne to be inherited by his son. Uh, I said I called Juan de Young was son, sorry, his grandson, but it was inherited by his son, uh, Hong Xi's son, Juan de Emperor, who reigned from 1425 to 1435 CE. And again, as I said, in Juan de's reign, he completed the uh, the uh, pagoda. And he also allowed for Zheng He to complete his seventh expedition because during this time, during this 10 year period of time, uh, the Hongxi Emperor had ended the Zheng He's voyages uh, because of how expensive they were. Uh, as well as the fact that he needed Zheng He to help in a couple of other military campaigns uh, at the time. And then when Hong Shi died, Zhuan De needed Zheng He to help finish the pagoda. Uh, but once the pagoda was finished, uh, Zhuan De Emperor allowed for Zheng He to complete his seventh and final voyage and from 1431 to 1433 CE. But it wasn't with it, it, and sorry in the foreign affairs the foreign the the uh, foreign uh, affairs by Zhuan, of the Ming Dynasty and the Zhuang Day reign were about of a mixed bag. So for one thing, uh, Zhuang Day Emperor uh, was able to reopen contact with uh, at least part of Japan. Uh, well, sorry, not part of part of modern day Japan, not part of Japan at the time, was able to open contact with the Ryukin Kingdom uh, of Sanzen uh, in the islands that we know of as Okinawa, and was able to gain it was able to gain some degree of submission from them, i.e., the Sanzen Kingdom, like Korea, acknowledged China as suzerain, as in i.e., even more i.e. Uh, the Ryukin Sanzen Kingdom became a tributary state to the Ming Dynasty. However, the, the as I said, the foreign affairs, foreign relations during Zhuang Dei's reign was a bit of a mixed bag, because during Zhuang Dei's reign, the uh, various Vietnamese kingdoms, the Da Viet, da Viet and Champa, uh, were able to launch a large-scale rebellion. Uh, really starting during Yongle Emperor's time, but also during, but ending in Zhuang Dei's time, uh, and drove out Ming China from Vietnam. And it was also during this time that uh, the Mongols were still become were still essentially a incredibly powerful threat, uh, leading several. Uh, several very successful raids south. Uh, and so this brings us to the reigns of the Yingzong and the Jingtai emperors. <laughs> uh, with the Yingzong emperor reigning from 1427 to 1464 CE and the Jingtai emperor reigning from 1449 and 1457 CE. Okay, so as I said, the Mongol, the Mongol tribes to the north were still a very large threat, and nothing illustrates this better than an event known as the Tumu Crisis, where essentially Emperor Yingzong, uh, being a uh, <laughs> unsurprisingly frustrated at the continued raids from the western Mongol tribes, the Orets, uh, decided to launch an invasion or an expedition into Orat territory. Uh, and during that time, he stopped at, and he was going to personally lead it too, uh, and he stopped at the Tumu Fort. However, <laughs> the leader of the Orat Mongols at the time, Essen, uh, began to it figured out what was going on, and so he launched a lightning raid into the this region of China, uh, which was supposed to be the uh, the springboard for Ying Zong's invasion of Mongolia. 
uh, defeated the Ming army at Tumu Fort and captured Emperor Ying Zong and held him in captivity for a certain amount of time. Now, the Ming Empire was eventually able to negotiate with the Oirats, uh, with the Oirat Mongols, uh, with Essen for Ying Zong's freedom. However, <laughs> a Jingtai Emperor, uh, the younger brother of, uh, sorry, well, I don't know, the, the relative of uh, Ying Zong, decided this meant that Ying Zong Emperor was not a uh, was not an adequate emperor, so he seized the throne and placed the Ying Zong Emperor in house arrest, um, a practice that was very common in East Asia uh, because it was still held with Confucian values of respecting the family, but also uh, meant that you could that you uh, were punishing uh, a family member for not being a virtuous and adequate family member. Ha uh, uh, sorry. However, eventually, uh, <laughs> the Ying Zong Emperor would return and retake the throne. In fact, if we go back here, you'll notice it says 1427 to 1464, while uh, Jingtai's uh, reign was 1449 uh, to 1457. And that's because eventually Ying Zong Emperor was able to launch a coup of his own and retake the throne. Uh, in 1457, and he reigned from 1457 again until 1464. And it was during this time as well that various Ming soldiers, both of uh, Chinese and Mongolian descent, uh, conducted various campaigns uh, in, no, known as the Lushuan Ping Mian campaign. Uh, and it was these veterans of these campaigns that would eventually come to heads with the Yingzong Emperor. And this is because the Yingzong Emperor began, and because of his captivity with the Mongols, began to grow suspicious of, of individuals in the Ming court who were of Mongol descent. So, and he actually began to initiate purges of Mongol people of Mongol descent whom he didn't trust. So, in response to this, a powerful general known as Cao Qin uh, gathered many of his forces and actually attempted to launch a coup of his own uh, against the Yingzong Emperor, attacking the Forbidden City. However, this did not go well <laughs> because. Uh, the Ming army was able to chase, was able to essentially hunt down and corner Cao Xin's army within the Forbidden City and completely obliterate them. Okay, so now that we have taken a look at the, some of the first emperors of the Ming Dynasty, uh, for one thing, it's important to note that after the Tumu Crisis and after the rebellion of Cao Xin, uh, Ying Zong Emperor began to pull uh, forces back from the uh, from uh, pull Mo uh, began to pull Ming military forces from the border of Mongolia uh, or from outside the border of Mongolia uh, in Mongolian territory and began to pull them back into Chinese territory and began to fortify the Mongol border uh, and essentially attempted a yet uh, not quite as strict as say. Uh, the Hongwu Emperor, but he began to sort of initiate a, at least with the Mongols, a period of isolationism. But despite that, the period between the Yingzong Emperor's reign and later emperors, uh, about a hundred years or so of it, were, was a period of relative stability, prosperity, and development. And this is, so this is the next section we're going to cover. So first, we are going to take a look at the makeup of the Ming government during this period of time. So during this period of time, the Ming government was, was divided into the emperor at the head, and then you had three divisions that included the five military uh, ministries, uh, the five chief military ministries, uh, the uh, six 
uh, I'm sorry, the five mil uh, chief military commissions, these six ministries, and then the censorate. And then, of course, they were divided into their own sections, making for an incredibly stable and complex government. And the backbone of the uh, of the Ming government was the imperial examination system, where it were essentially anybody who would, had passed more regional, smaller examination systems, uh, and who was a uh, was any form of literati could come uh, yearly to a imperial examination. Uh, and if they passed the so-called eight-legged essay, they could become a high, uh, high-level imperial bureaucrat. And the eight imperial examination system and the eight-legged essay was built upon uh, the Confucian, uh, the the Confucian classics, uh, and they were as well as um, general, uh, as well as in general history uh, and other ph philosophical aspects. Uh, in fact, here's a copy of the eight-legged essay right here. Uh, and this, in theory, and in fact, it did work that way, that meant that many of the Ming bureaucrats were the most qualified people possible. Now, this would eventually change later on, after this hundred-year period, uh, and really towards the end of the hundred-year period, but this did allow for the government to have a high population of very qualified government officials. And during, also during this period, a hundred year period, uh, the Ming Dynasty began to urbanize heavily uh, with large scale cities rising, uh, being made and rising in population. Uh, and in these cities, you could find things include a number of very uh, a number of what we would, could think of as modern things, uh, such as brothels and public baths, uh, public baths of which are still very common in East Asia, uh, as well as transportation uh, was very stable during this period of time, with a large system of roads being used to get around in the north of China, as seen in this picture of uh, Confucius making his way to uh, one of the Zhou capitals uh, from the Zhou dynasty. Uh, and in the south, a very complex system of canals based around the Grand Canal were the primary way for the individuals in the south to get around. And this meant that uh, much like our modern world, it was very easy for people in the Chinese Empire to go, say, north to south or south, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, or south to north or east to west uh, in relatively quick amounts of time. And, of course, it allowed for the large-scale uh, transportation of food. Also in these cities, one could find... Uh, Shops that sold things like uh, money that one would burn as offerings to ancestors. They could find uh, tea ceremony, uh, things important in tea ceremonies, tea sets, uh, large amounts of tea. Uh, and this was contrasted by uh, rural life, in which rural life, is a, in, in contrast to urban life, you would find individuals in rural towns focused more on agrarian lifestyles. Uh, in the South, these agrarian lifestyle, lifestyles would be focused around uh, rice production, whereas in the North, you would find individuals focused on millet production. Uh, also in the South, especially, individuals could make extra business, uh, extra money, uh, selling sugar cane and citrus fruits, as well as they could take their t make money uh, burning wood for charcoal, uh, which was which was and still is incredibly useful in cooking for the higher temperature uh, 
and slower burn and lower burn that could be used in cooking. Uh, they would oftentimes ground up oysters uh, and other shellfish to make agricultural lime, which is, um, uh, and, you know, agricultural limestone, which is incredibly important when to in farming to add uh, nutrients to particularly uh, uh, infertile soils or soils that aren't or that are fertile but not quite fertile enough to grow certain crops. They also would take their time to weave together rugs and mats, as well as hats, all of which would be sold at local markets for extra money in addition to the money that they would make based off of farming. That being said, the for much of the Ming's history, uh, the Ming government, starting actually with the Hongwu Emperor, uh, passed and upheld what were known as sumptuary laws. Uh, essentially, sumptuary laws are the idea uh, that uh, color, that certain pieces of clothing and certain uh, pieces of furniture and things like that were forbidden to be owned by the peasant class and the lower classes of society. So, certain like again, certain hats, certain pieces of furniture. Uh, Etc. Jade, for example, were all out. Were all forbidden by to be owned by the lower classes of the Ming Dynasty. And during this period, uh, along with urban growth and government stability, there was also a great flourishing of the arts. You had music and poetry that flourished as well. Uh, like, say, the Book of the Odes, which was written during this period of time. Uh, and we have a number of instruments, such as the this uh, um, stringed instrument, uh, mandolin, that, was, that were incredibly popular at the time. Musicians were a dime a dozen and could reasonably make a decent living during this period of time. Uh, literature and poetry was uh, was. Uh, was patronized during this period. In fact, during the Ming Dynasty, we have the Ming Dynasty to thank for many Chinese classical novels like the Water Marsh, uh, Water Marsh, Water Margin, uh, the incredibly popular, even to this day, uh, Journey to the West, as well as uh, various books of older pieces of poetry from the Tang and Sung dynasties were published during this time in order to preserve them uh, and as well spread them throughout a, through to a larger uh, literary populace. And of course, the, and of course, the this flourishing of the arts was not just uh, it was not just sequestered to music and literature. Beautiful paintings were also painted uh, during this period, like these painting paintings of mountains and waterfalls, paintings of flowers and other plant life. And you also had uh, ceramics that was that were produced in large quantities during this period of time, such as blue and other colorful uh, kinds of porcelain as well as uh, hard resins like lacquer were carved into beautiful pieces of artwork like this jewelry box that you see here. So, as you can see, um, the, Chin, the Ming Dynasty was a golden age for the flourishing of the arts. But it wasn't just that. It was also a golden age of technology and sciences. Granted, to a lesser degree than, say, the Tang Dynasty, uh, than, say, the Han uh, Dynasty, the uh, period of, th of the Three Kingdoms, the, Tang, uh, the uh, Tang Dynasty, and the Song Dynasty, but and the Yuan Dynasty, but still, it was, in its own way, a golden age of technological advancement. So, first of all, uh, it's important to note that during this period of time, uh, due to uh, increasing contact with Europeans, the Ming Dynasty did adopt some European inventions, like the astronomical clock, which was a 
upgraded version of the older Chinese water clocks that during the Tang and Song dynasties and Yuan dynasties made their way to Europe, um, as well as the creation of telescopes, uh, which again were upgraded versions of earlier astronomical uh, the astronomical instruments that had been developed during the Song and the Mongol Yuan dynasties. Uh, and of course, the introduction of muskets and arquebuses, uh, which were introduced by the Portuguese and were much more advanced than the uh, than some of the earlier gunpowder technologies that the Ming Dynasty had developed, uh, that the chi earlier Chinese Dynasty, sorry, had developed. Uh, we also see the reintroduction of technologies that, uh, in fact, most of these are reintroductions, but the reintroduction of technologies uh, to China, such as the field mill, which is uh, which had been developed in earlier dynasties of China, like the Han Dynasty uh, and the uh, Qin Dynasty, which were wagons that had mills, uh, i.e. things that uh, deposited seeds that were used as, um, sorry, not deposited seeds, ground seeds that were used as ways to uh, essentially provide grain for large amounts of grain to armies, because you could have it attached to this wagon, you could have grain in it, and as the horse comes along, the mill grinds away, grinding up the grain, allowing for an army to allowing for an army to be fed on large scales and on large campaigns. But it also wasn't a one-way street. The Europeans were also incredibly interested in Chinese inventions. Uh, one example is the snorkel, which the Chinese were fascinated with, the Chinese, sorry, which the Europeans were fascinated with because it allowed for Chinese farmers to, in a um, Chinese merchants to dive to the to uh, underneath the bay underneath bays and to coral reefs in order to uh, get a hold of uh, oyster shells and clams to be ground up into agricultural lime as well as again clams to get uh, precious materials such as oysters. The Europeans were also fascinated with a particular. Uh, wagon, the, what they describe as a wagon with a cell attached to it, uh, which allowed for the Chinese peasants to more easily transport goods. As many of you can guess by the picture, this was the wheelbarrow, which is still used by uh, many of us in our modern world to this day in our yards to transport soil, all kinds of things. The Europeans were also incredibly interested in the silk industry. Uh, now, it's important to note that Europe had already gained a hold of some uh, of the silk industry to a degree during the Byzantine Empire, uh, when the Byzantine Empire sent emissaries to Tang Dynasty China, which reigned from six the late 600s CE to 950 CE, uh, and were able to secretly sneak out some uh, silk, uh, some silkworms, uh, and bring the silk production to Europe. But, of course, you know, 950 CE to uh, 1368 and really to the uh, 1500s, which is what we're talking about now, uh, that's between 400 to uh, 400, uh, yeah, 400 to 600 years in, you know, amount of time. I mean, China, of course, had improved upon this. And so, seeing on the improvements that Ming China made to the silk production, Europe, uh, the European powers <laughs> adopted this new Ming production, I mean, these new silk production techniques. They were also incredibly interested in the Ming metallurgy industry, uh, with one example being a, an early version of the steel mill, where essentially 
the uh, the Chinese metallurgist would attach a water wheel to power iron tipped hammers that could be used to uh, to work and bend uh, and form metal pieces of metal for various needs like say artwork armor what have you uh, one to uh, in, in a very quick amount of time and two high quantities of these metal products uh, therefore allowing for the quicker production and distribution of metal of high quality steel products throughout the Ming Empire which of course the Europeans wanted because hey well, we can use this to uh, increase our steel production as well and the Europeans were also incredibly interested in the Chi uh, Ming Chinese smelting processes. Uh, one of these processes was the use of a blast furnace or a crucible, which the Ming uh, Chinese would use to create very high quality, uh, very high quality uh, steel. And then also the quenching process, which is a process where uh, now, I'm not a blacksmith, so anybody who's a blacksmith who's watching, feel free to correct me. But it's a process where essentially one dips a hot piece, of, a freshly made hot piece of steel into uh, a bucket of oil, uh, essentially to quench it and allow uh, it to, it, essentially to hopefully ensure that the steel object keeps its heart. And of course, this combined with the steel mill would allow for the very quick uh, production of high, of large amounts of high quality steel. Uh, during this period of time, Ming, Ch uh, the Ming Chinese science advancements also included uh, medicinal advancements. This included uh, the creation of the Bin Sao Gong Mu, which had a variety of medicinal treatments, uh, including inoculation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, inoculation was an early form of vaccination uh, for diseases such as smallpox, where right? you, you break off a one of the uh, sores or boils, the dried sores or boils on a person who's afflicted with smallpox, so you grind it up, uh, snort it, and you, you get a little sick, but you also your body also builds antibodies, and that and these techniques were developed during Ming China. Also developed during Ming China was another medicinal object that is used in our modern day, uh, because of course inoculation is since been upgraded to vaccination and is goes completely different. But something that was developed uh, in Ming China that we still use relatively in the same form to this day is a little ingenious tool called the toothbrush which helped and greatly improve and still does to this day dental hygiene but it wasn't just uh, per, um, it wasn't just metallurgical uh, it wasn't just the metallurgy industry and the medicinal industry that uh, had me medicinal industry, medicinal sciences that had advancements during this period. There were also military advancements, unsurprisingly, that were utilized during this period. During this period, Chinese military technology saw the production of many incredibly important, incredibly powerful gunpowder weapons. Uh, these included a variety of uh, of of mines, uh, uh, sea, uh, um, aquatic mines, sea mines, underwater mines, uh, which you know would sit underwater and could be ignited uh, by a flint to blow up naval ships. You had intricate networks of landmines that were produced during this period of time. Uh, also. Uh, landmine. Uh, so how these? Let me go back to this. The intricate, these intricate networks of landmines. Uh, how they would work is you have all these landmines set throughout, uh, and you could often like leave a mound, uh, say with like say a sword or a piece of armor, 
uh, and it or something like that, and then somebody could would pull could pull the sword up, uh, and boom, you know, or just like a a a, a, a yeah, you know a pole, anything that could in, could set off the mine, and it would cause a vast amount of damage to uh, the military to any enemy military. And then you had mines that were set up on these strings that one all one had to do was pull a string, uh, and and in these little boxes right here, flints would be lit, it would be struck, and light fuses and go down the chain and cause explosions that way. Uh, the Ming Dynasty also utilized a lot of uh, what you would know as rocket launchers. Uh, you had several, you had rocket launchers that had hundreds of arrows, like this one you see here, that was actually the inspiration for an earlier version of the rocket launcher, uh, for not earlier version, for a later version of the rocket launcher called the Wacha in uh, Korea. You had handheld rocket launchers that you could carry and light and uh, arrows and other forms of explosives would uh, shoot out that way. Uh, and, of course, they had a variety of cannons, very well-made cannons. And it's important to mention this because while the musket arquebus technology from Europe was far more advanced uh, than the Ming Chinese muskets um, in earlier versions, uh, and their, their earlier versions, which are called hand cannons that were attached to poles, uh, the cannon technology, the artillery technology of Ming China was actually more advanced than European technology. Uh, and you had uh, cannons that could be used on smaller frames, as well as cannons meant for large-scale uh, sieges. Uh, and, you, you know, cannons like this that could be mounted on ships. And most, in, most fascinatingly, uh, the Ming Dynasty also made use of multi-stage rockets. Um, to be fair, some of these had been developed in the Yuan Dynasty, but they were still in use in the Ming Dynasty. Uh, and they were took a variety of shapes. Uh, some were in the shape of dragons uh, that could be launched from uh, battleships, or they had rockets on each end and a one-man rocket going out. Though, this is, to be fair, this is a Di a more intricate diagram. Uh, many historians and engineers have suggested that perhaps while still possessing the dragon head, the rocket was a little simpler in design for practical use. But either way, it had uh, rockets that allowed, propelled it, and in its mouth it had uh, arrows with rockets attached to them that could be numbered between, you know, 5 to 20, you know, firing out at the enemy, uh, on top of the fact that it had gunpowder uh, packed into its frame, so that once it ran out of its uh, out of its arrow amount of arrows, and it hit into a ship, it would explode. And then they had other similar multi-stage rockets in the shape of animals, such as birds, where it would be propelled and could be used as a way to fire off uh, arrows onto enemy lines. And of course, uh, as one of the most famous things that uh, one of the things that China is most famous for is its connection to global trade, and the Ming Dynasty is no different. So during uh, the Ming Dynasty, uh, European nations such as the Portuguese and the Spanish Empire began to make you know, began to establish footholds in East Asia with uh, the Portuguese setting up in uh, areas such as the Sultanate of Malacca and Indonesia, uh, and the Spanish setting up in areas like uh, New Guinea and the Philippines. Uh, and during the, and in this newly expanded global trade, the Chinese would often export uh, luxury uh, items that were considered luxury items by these European powers, such as the uh, as I mentioned earlier, the beautiful uh, porcelain, uh, the beautiful porcelain ceramics, uh, silk fabrics, 
they would export uh, either uh, some in both cases. Sometimes they would export raw ivory, but also they would export ivory that was carved into artwork, as well as lacquerware, uh, dried resin that was carved into artwork uh, and um, uh, utensils and plates as well. And of course, one of the most sought after objects by all European powers were spices, which China was able to provide large quantities of, many of which they grew themselves, but some of which they also would obtain from areas like India and uh, uh, Sumatra and things like that. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, many European countries uh, European people don't use spices, despite the European countries having come to East Asia for them, but they still sought them out. And so China was able to make quite a lot of profit off of their, the trade of all these luxury items. Uh, and in return, yeah, in return, uh, China would trade with uh, both the Spanish Empire and various uh, daimyos or feudal lords from the Sengoku period of Japan for, uh, well, for Japan, from Japan, they would trade uh, these luxury goods for luxury goods of their own, uh, such as Japanese fans, um, uh, paper screens. Uh, and from Spain, they would tr uh, trade these goods for Spanish silver, which was being mined in Spanish colonies in the Americas. Uh, and here's the silver trade that you see right here. And it was, a, so overall, this is a very lucrative trade, a uh, very lucrative trade network for everyone involved. But this this uh, contact with Europeans uh, was not all peaceful. There were several conflicts uh, between the China I mean, sorry between the Ming government and the European powers. Now I have already done a in depth video on uh, the main conflicts with the European powers of the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the Spanish. I will include that in the iCard, but we, we still need to go over it a little bit. So, so the Portuguese empire uh, was one of the largest empires in the world at the time, and it began to uh, make a foothold in East Asia uh, asking China for permission to set up a uh, set of trading posts in Macau, which they granted. Uh, the island of Macau, which is located here on the southeastern coast of uh, China. However, uh, this would eventually change. One, uh, Portugal began to sort of try and flex its muscles as an empire in China, which China did not like at all. Uh, and eventually forced, uh, eventually after uh, Portugal trying to use its uh, flex its imperial muscles to get more trade uh, and uh, more trade and more benef and more beneficial uh, and essentially special treatment from the Ming government, uh, the Ming government forced uh, the Portuguese to withdraw from various islands uh, off the coast of China, including Macau. So, in response to this, uh, as well as in response to some earlier skirmishes that all ended in Ming Dynasty victory, uh, the Portuguese Empire made an alliance uh, with a uh, member of the uh, royal family of the Malacca Sultanate and helped them stage a coup uh, in the Malacca Sultanate and installed their new puppet emperor as the head of the Malacca Sultanate. Uh, and this was a big problem because the Malacca Sultanate was one of the several tributary kingdoms of, Ming, of the Ming Dynasty. So in response to this, the Ming Dynasty defeated the Portuguese Navy not once, but twice at the Battles of Tungnen, um, heavily defeating the Portuguese uh, and essentially 
telling the Portuguese, like, we'll allow you to continue trade, but don't do it again. Now that we have gotten that out of the way, so we, we've gone over uh, the sort of essentially the height of the Ming Dynasty, uh, where trade flourished and was profitable for everyone. Uh, art, uh, arts of all kinds flourished. Technological advancements were being made in leaps and bounds uh, for both scientific and military and medicinal. Um, as well as the fact that the Ming government was actually uh, showing the uh, showing the European colonial powers that it was in fact um, it was in fact more powerful, at least to a certain degree, than these European powers were at the time. But that began to change, uh, and it began to change specifically in the reigns of the Longqing and the Wanli emperors. Uh, with the Longqing Emperor reigning from 1567 to 1572 CE, and the Wanli Emperor reigning from 1572 to 1620 CE. Uh, and this was a period of, one, military reforms, but also of the overall decline of the Ming Dynasty. So during the reign of Longqing Emperor, is the, the reign of Longqing Emperor is where this decline really began to become uh if not if not begin altogether it really began began to become apparent uh and one of the events that happened during this period of time that made it apparent was the Ming conflict with the mongol han altan han who was on the left and this is the Longqing emperor and the Altan Han controlled a large portion of modern-day Mongolia to the north of the Ming Empire. And he, during that period of time, uh, conducted several very, very successful raids onto, into Ming territory. Uh, even, in one point, reaching all the way to Beijing and sacking parts of Beijing the capital of the Ming Dynasty. Uh, and this was done uh, to the detriment of the Ming Army because the Ming Army, for the longest time, with the exception of some military engagements against the Portuguese, had been relatively, uh, had been relatively stagnant. I mean, yes, as I said earlier, military advancements had been made with, you know, various... Uh, uh, various types of cannons and rocket launchers, multi-stage missiles, but without large-scale uh, extended conflicts, the Ming army was relatively inexperienced. Uh, and that the the very successful raids by Altan Khan made that incredibly apparent. And then this was increasingly exacerbated by increasing raids by the Waco Pirates. So originally, as we saw earlier, the Waco Pirates raided generally, uh, their raids were generally contained to the northeast portion of the Ming Kingdom, as well as the coast of Korea. By the time of the uh, Wanli Emperor and the uh, Jingtong Emperor, uh, this these Waco raids actually extended all through the entire coast of China, and in fact, and at, at one point, a mere eighty Waco pirates were able to invade into the eastern part of China through their river systems, and was able to cause a large amount of destruction before the Ming army was able to mobilize and finally put an end to it. So, th this. In fact, many of the Ming military engagements with the Waco, the Ming Navy uh, engagements with the Waco, uh, began to become losses. In fact, the losses began racking up. Uh, now, I mean, of course, this is only uh, between uh, 30 to 50 years after the Ming Navy humiliated the Portuguese Navy uh, twice. But a lot can happen in 30 to 50 years. So, as a response, uh, now, uh, and then we come into the Wanli Emperor, uh, who reigned uh, from 1572 to 1620 CE. 
Uh, and during his reign, as a response to the stagnation of uh, and the inexperience of the Ming Empire, of the Ming military, uh, certain Ming generals began to implement military reforms. The first of these was the Ming general Yu Dayu, who, uh, being an accomplished martial artist, uh, began to implement martial arts training as uh, one of the requirements to, uh, to Ming soldiers. And he did this by combining both his own family forms of martial arts and also the staff techniques of the Shaolin monks. Uh, and, he can, can, and he compiled all of these into a martial arts manual. Now, you might be asking, Dane, well, what does this have to do with military reforms? You know, well, as I said, he made sure that the main soldiers under his service uh, had these manuals and practiced them. But also, uh, the importance of staff techniques, uh, the use of ta uh, the uh, staff techniques are uh, incredibly important because of spears. When all, all, uh, what is a spear if not a staff <laughs> with a blade attached to it? So all of these uh, staff-based techniques were used as a way to make sure soldiers were much more competent with spears, which was one of the most common weapons used by main soldiers, uh, and what were much better trained. But that being said, uh, Udaya was not the one who made the most gains in, Ming, in the military reforms of the Ming military. That go that uh Say how to put this. That credit goes to the Ming general Qi Ji Wang. So Qi Ji Wang was a young military general who had participated in the defense of Beijing against the Altan Han, and uh, along with Yu Daio, no, as well as the Wako raids, along with Yu Daio, noticed the inadequacies of the Ming military, and so. He took it upon himself after being stationed on the coast uh, to deal with the uh, with the Waco raids. Essentially, he had his ideas uh, caught the attention of several Ming officials, and they thought, "You're right. Maybe we should implement some of your ideas." So they get stationed him uh, on the coast, where at the present, the most pressing and most immediate threat were the Waco pirates. So Qi Jin Wang, while there, created uh, one of his manuals uh, titled A New Manual on Military Efficiency, where he basically uh, gutted the entire mil uh, the old Ming military training uh, and completely reworked it. Uh, and at lunch, like Yu Dao, he included... Uh, uh, the importance of martial arts training, with Chi Jing Wang himself being an incredibly com a incredibly skilled martial artist. But it wasn't just that. He also uh, began working on the improvement of Ming military formations, uh, creating a variety of formations uh, with that included the use of pole arms, uh, various types of pole arms, uh, swords combined with pole arms, uh, sword heavily armored sword divisions. Uh, as well as the use of arquebuses and muskets. He implemented essentially line fire formations, you know, which were, would be used uh, by much of the world uh, until roughly around the American Civil War and wars uh, related to it, uh, because line formations with arquebuses and muskets was the most uh, effective way of uh, the use of the musket because it could cause the most damage. Um, as well as the combination of line formations with formations of uh, line formations of muskets with formations of swords uh, and uh, and highly diverse formations overall, including some that had uh, soldiers who would use muskets in the front, and then people with spears and tridents in the back, and then archers and swordsmen, etc., uh, making the Ming military highly trained and highly efficient and highly adaptable. He also uh, improved 
uh, the improved military camp formations, making essentially military camp formations uh, uh, pseudo forts, like heavily fortified positions. And he included in his manuals um, diagrams for how to set up military lines and military formations going into combat. What, uh, with this, he was able to completely uh, reorganize and revamp the main military. And once he did that, he and Udayo, uh, as well as other main generals, launched lightning campaigns against the various Wako pirate warlords and was able to quickly and efficiently put them down. In response to the great success by uh, by Chi Chi Wong and revamping the Ming military and the successes of these reforms uh, by Chi Chi Wong uh, in allowing the Ming army to finally overcome the uh, threat of the various Wako pirate warlords, the Ming uh, government just thought, hey, you did a great job. Why don't you do it with the Mongols now? And so Chi Chi Wong was sent and stationed north for the rest of his military career, really, uh, to the northernmost border of the Ming Dynasty, where he took the time to rebuild and improve upon most of the Great Wall, as the Great Wall had, since the beginning of the Yuan Dynasty, had fallen in repair uh, and disuse. There were some parts of it that were still used, but overall, generally, it was... Uh, in disrepair and useless. So he, using his, uh, he was able to organize a large scale construction project that allowed him to re, uh, to allow him to rebuild and improve upon, uh, and make the Ming, uh, make the Great Wall of China a much more formidable fortification. Uh, and this included, uh, of course, making it out of stone rather than wood and uh, stamped earth like earlier versions have been, but also by installing various cannon batteries, uh, like you see here and here, which could be used in conjunction with bins in the uh, Great Wall. Uh, he, he very purposely made various parts of the Great Wall bend into these curves uh, so that when Mongol or other tribal soldiers would try to rush up to these areas, uh, it would allow for a deadly crossfire uh, to happen to the Mongol forces from the cannons. So so instead of one, instead of just charging at this one part of the wall and just getting a few cannons firing at you, you're charging at this part of the wall and all the cannons in this area open up on you at once incredibly deadly and it allowed for Chi Chi Wong to uh, both use the main the Great Wall of China as a defensive measure but it also allowed it to it allowed him to use it as a way to launch raids into Mongol territory uh, and eventually these uh, these military reforms uh, would be put to the ultimate test. These military reforms of Udayo and Chi Ji Wong having been proven in uh, the campaign against the Waco pirates as well as in campaigns against the main, uh, sorry, against the Mongol forces uh, would now be put to even more of a test, the, like I said, the ultimate test and uh, what are known as the three great campaigns of the Wanli Emperor. Uh, which ran from 1589 to 1598 CE. The first of these three campaigns, oh, sorry, the first of these three campaigns that we're going to discuss uh, is the Ningxia campaign, also known as the Pubei Revolt, uh, Ningxia being the region right over here. So the background of this is during this period of time, during the reign of the Wanli Emperor, uh, the a powerful Mongol chieftain of the uh, of the Chahar tribe of the Chahar clan had actually willingly submitted himself to the Ming Emperor Wanli Emperor and had become uh, in return for essentially becoming a government official in the region of Ningxia. However, uh, other government officials in the region refused to give these titles or to give up authority to Pubei. 
Uh, so in response, Pu Bei and various Ming generals and officials who were allied with him killed the their in their rival Ming officials who refused to give them titles and started a rebellion in Ningxia, uh, gathering an army of around forty eight thousand. In response to this, the Wanli Emperor was forced to divert. Uh, well, it was forced to divert and send in 40,000 Ming soldiers under the leadership of the General Li Rusong, who uh, marched in to Ningxia and after a year of hard fighting was able to put down the rebellion. Uh, meanwhile, uh, in the south, uh, was happening the Bo Zhou Rebellion, which was started by an uh, a uh, yeah a Miao uh, the, in the south lived the Miao people uh, and and a Miao warlord by the name of Yang Li Long, uh, growing tired of Ming uh, of Ming rulership of being a Ming subject and smelling weakness in the air. Uh, started the Boju Rebellion, uh, causing uh, Ming admirals uh, and Ming forces to be sequestered during this pe uh, period of time. Uh, specifically, the very skilled Ming admiral Admiral Shen Li, who was uh, brought, who was forced to bring with him much of the Ming navy. However, after about four years of fighting from 1589 to 1593, uh, the rebellion was temporarily put to an end. However, unlike with Li Rusong, who through sh the force of the military defeated Pu Bei and the Ningxia Reve uh, Revolt and Ningxia Rebellion, uh, Shen Li was given orders by Wan the Wanli Emperor to make a proposition. To Yang uh, to Yang Ling Long, uh, Yang yeah to Yang Ying Long, and that was um, w is we'll ignore the rebellion that you started and we'll give you more independence if you help us fight uh, in a much larger conflict, and that much larger conflict is uh, is what we're about to talk about next. Because you might have noticed, I said I said they were the one Emperor was forced to so it was forced to uh, to uh, not re remove. He was forced to uh, uh, withdraw main forces from certain fronts to deal with these rebellions. And you might ask, well, what are those fronts? Why was it, why is it a him being forced to? Uh, redeploy Ming forces. And that larger threat, that larger conflict, was Toitomi Hideyoshi's invasions of Korea. So Toitomi Hideyoshi was an incredibly powerful uh, daimyo or feudal lord of the Sengoku period of Japan. Uh, and during this period, uh, the Toitomi Hideyoshi had been a uh, the primary general of another daimyo, Oda Nobunaga, who had initiated a the uh, unification of uh, of all of Japan, but Oda Nobunaga had died before he could complete that. Uh, but Toyotomi Hideyoshi took on the task himself and continued it, uh, uniting. Much, conquering much of Japan that you see here in gray by 1582, and then by 1589 uh, and, and 1590, conquering the rest. And so, with that, and so with once he conquered and reuni reunified Japan, Toyotomi Hideyoshi uh, found that he had a uh, found that he had a conundrum on his hands. Uh, and this conundrum was the fact that he now had uh, one an army of between 100 to 150,000, uh, 170,000 uh, that had no use, and then two. Uh, the other part of this conundrum was that a lot of these soldiers still owed their loyalties to their 
daimyos because through much of Toitomi Hideyoshi's and Obunaga, Oda Nobunaga's conquests, they had incorporated various other powerful daimyos into their armies. And, uh, Toitomi Hideyoshi to a greater degree because Oda Nobunaga was more interested in just pure conquest, uh, whereas Toitomi Hideyoshi was was willing to, so long as you submitted and acknowledged that, told you that uh, he was your lord, uh, that he would allow you to hold on to at least some degree of your domains. Um, and these included individuals like the Hojo, the Shimazu, the Chosakabe, uh, the, and the Date clan, uh, the Date clans and the Mori clans. Uh, all very powerful, uh, all very powerful daimyos and with very powerful clans. And so he, Toitomi Hideyoshi, now that he had conquered and reunified Japan, was realized and was worried that if I don't find a common enemy, uh, the all of these powerful warlords, all these powerful feudal lords, these powerful uh, uh, petty kings might turn on me and I'm going to lose all of my army to yet another civil war. Uh, so he well, he began to look for this common enemy. Uh, and that common enemy was the Joseon Kingdom of Korea and the Ming Dynasty. Uh, now, part of this was, as I said, to as a way to essentially keep his uh, all of his generals busy. Uh, one, so they could have the common enemy, and two, so they wouldn't turn against him. Uh, but it was also because Toyotomi Hideyoshi, being a conqueror, was like, huh, what if I take this century-old uh, concept of the uh, Chinese empires being the big boy on the block in every other country, like the Korean kingdoms and the Japanese kingdoms being the tributary vassal states of the Ming Empire, and why don't I, and why don't I flip that on its head, and Japan becomes the big man on the block, and all, and Ming China and Korea and such, and he even uh, thought about uh, possibly if he succeeded India, what if all of they become the tributary states to me? And so, with this idea in mind, with these ideas of keeping his generals busy and having a, you know, a a common enemy, as well as the idea of world conquest, Toitomi Hideyoshi initiated the uh, invasion of Joseon Korea. First, he actually tried to convince Joseon Korea to allow him to march through uh, to the Ming Dynasty. Uh essentially he's like we'll spare you if you allow us safe passage through your country to the Ming Dynasty however <laughs> the Korean kingdoms uh, the starting with the Gojoseon and then the Joseon here were loyal vassals of the Ming Dynasty they were proud to be vassals of the Ming Dynasty they openly adopted Chinese culture and everything and so they were like no we're not going to turn against them. the The Chinese, the Ming Chinese, the Mongol Yuan, uh, the Tang Dynasty, etc. They treated us well, and so in response to this refusal to allow the Japanese forces to invade Toyotomi Hideyoshi, uh, in response to this this answer of no for allowing the Japanese soldiers to march through uh, on a uh, Unimpeded, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi uh, brought his 150,000 <laughs> strong Japanese military uh, to Korea and launched the invasion. Uh, and these were heavily trained, battle hardened individuals. Uh, the Japanese, much like the Chinese, in fact, to a greater degree of the Chinese, um, utilized Harkabus line formations uh, and they were incredibly skilled at that. They had a large navy that was really not quite as advanced as the Korean Navy. Um, and they had very skilled warriors, uh, so, uh, very skilled elite warriors called samurai, though most of their military was actually uh, groups known as Ashigakure uh, that used either spears or, um, or arquebuses, uh, as well as they had very experienced military leaders like, uh, like Kato Kiyomasa that you see here. Uh, or actually, it's Kanishi Yukinaga, but uh, 
point is he had he had dozens of very skilled very experienced military leaders who were able to conduct a very brutal campaign into korea uh and they were able to very quickly march north and take the uh, take both the capital of seoul uh and the capital of pyongyang um uh and for the longest time for the first couple for the first year or so korea was essentially on its own for one thing korea you felt obligated the Joseon dynasty felt obligated to essentially do this on their own it's like that they're they're the, they're the loyal vassals they're the loyal tributaries it's their job to prevent to stop this invasion on the tracks not china's so they really didn't send much word However, China heard about it anyway because the Ryukin kingdoms of the Sanzen kingdoms and Ryuken, in the Ryukin Islands uh, sent them word that they had heard that it was happening. Uh, but because of the Boju rebellion, the Boju and the Ningxia rebellions, um, China was not able to immediately mobilize. However, once these rebellions were put down, the Wanli Emperor. Uh, ordered Li Ru Song to raise an army of around 40,000, uh, 35,000 to 40,000, uh, and march into Korea, uh, which he did. He marched into Korea and quickly made up with uh, Joseon soldiers, uh, uh, numbering around 10,000 to 20,000, swelling his army to between 50 and 60,000. And with this army, he was able to uh, defeat the Japanese in several pitched battles and several sieges, including the siege of the sieges of Pyongyang and Seoul. Now, of course, this wasn't without some defeats. Uh, let's see if I got that yet. Uh, some defeats because uh, uh, Li Rusong did lose a couple of battles to the uh, Japanese forces. I mean, the Japanese forces were by no means pushovers. They were every bit as skilled at this point as the main military. Uh, in fact, Li Ru Song admitted that uh, while he had the better artillery, while he had the better cannons and better rocket launchers and everything like that, that the Japanese had the better muskets and arquebuses. And that, that just tells you how evenly matched they were. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the, uh, the Navy aspect of the uh, what would be known as the engine war uh, the Japanese invasions of Korea were handled by the primarily by the Korean general Yi Sun Sin uh, who won some, quite a few battles uh, against the Japanese fleet because the Korean fleet was just better overall than the Japanese fleet uh, but also uh, the naval uh, front, the naval theater of the war was also focused on by Shin Li, the admiral who was uh, forced to be relocated to the Boju Rebellion. And together, uh, Yi Sun Sin, who again did the brunt of the fighting uh, beforehand, and Shin Li were able to defeat uh, uh, decisively and permanently the Japanese fleet at the Battle of No Ryong. However, uh, despite this victory, uh, so actually, let me finish what I was saying. So, and, and so with these victories, with the retaking of Seoul and the defeat of the Japanese fleet at the Battle of, of No Ryong, uh, over the course of, from 1593 to 1598, eventually the Japanese were forced to completely withdraw to uh, Japan and ending the, uh, ending the invasion overall. Uh, however, the damage from these three campaigns had already been done. The Ming Dynasty was already set. Uh, by the time the Yang, uh, the Wanli Emperor died in 1620, the Ming Dynasty, Dynasty was already um, on the precipice of falling. Uh, and this again, much like the Yuan Dynasty, was predicated by a variety of natural disasters. Uh, first, far earlier during the reign of the, Wanli's father, uh, was the 1556 Shangxi earthquake that killed over 
uh, 833,000 people, as well as uh, yet a series of large-scale floods in the south uh, in central China destroyed a, a lot of urban areas and a lot of farmland. Uh, we also had the uh, large-scale famines caused by a climactic event known as the Little Ice Age, and essentially a 500-year uh, period of... Um, unseasonably cool winters and climate that made it incredibly difficult for crops to be grown and led to uh, low crop yields and famine. As well as the Great Plague, uh, the so-called Great Plague of 1633 and 1644, uh, which killed over 200,000 people. Um, and to be clear, this is uh, that medical text that I talked about where it talked about inoculation. This is what that is from. Uh, and this, all of this was exasperated even further by the disruptions in the silver trade. Uh, first, the Tokugawa shogunate, uh, founded by Tokugawa Ieyasu, uh, a, himself a general of Toitomi Hideyoshi, uh, cut off all trade with the outside world with the exception of two ports that allowed very limited trade with the Dutch and the Portuguese. Uh, and then the Spanish Empire began to uh, cut off silver trade uh, and crack down on the silver trade uh, in the Philippines uh, in favor of uh, the silver trade uh, within the Spanish Empire itself and with other European empires. And so th what this meant is that the valuable silver that was used as one of the backbones of the Ming economy during its height uh, was now gone, and so inflation began to shoot up. Uh, but it is it wasn't all bad uh, during this period uh, because the Chinese was still able to essentially flex its muscles uh, and prove that it was still one of the big guys on the block. Uh, one of the one of these examples is the Sino-Dutch conflict, which occurred between the 1620s and 1630s CE. And much like the Sino-Portuguese conflicts, I've already covered these in depth. Uh, in fact, in the same video as the Sino-Portuguese conflicts, but they still need to be covered. So the uh, the Dutch Empire, uh, really, this is a, a, about a hundred years after, but it's still a good. Um, visualization, the Dutch Empire began to make inroads into East Asia and Southeast Asia, creating colonies in Indonesia, uh, 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 in Burma, as well as uh, New Guinea, uh, and even parts of Australia and parts of China. Uh, however, the Dutch, much like the Portuguese, began to want more trade rights, and when China be refused them, uh, the Portuguese actually began to raid Chinese ports, which, much like the Portuguese conflicts, m most of the time, in fact, almost all the time, ended in Chinese victories. Uh, and this eventually led these, these losses to the Chinese and the want for more trade goods and more, uh, essentially, monopoly on the trade in the region overall. The Dutch made, a, uh, made alliances with various uh, with various pirate warlords uh, and leading the Chinese to defeat this coalition that the Portuguese, the Portuguese had put together at the Battle of uh, Leo Lo Bay in the 1630s. Uh, but despite this brief burst of uh, increased Chinese uh, of, of, of uh, increased Chinese military victories, uh, the Ming would not be able to stop their fall. And this fall came at the hand of the rise of the, uh, at the hand of the Manchu Qing dynasty, which began to rise during this time. So the Manchu were a, a nomadic tribe similar to the Mongolians uh, in the region known as Manchuria that you see here. That uh, for the longest time until uh, the uh, Janting and the Wanli emperors pulled their forces back. Uh, not Janting, uh, the, the uh, uh, Yingluang emperor pulled his forces south uh, of the Great Wall. 
uh, the Qing began to rise during this decline of the Ming Dynasty. In fact, the Manchus, the Qings, all uh, the Qings, uh, also known as the Jurchens, um, briefly participated in the uh, Korean. In, in the war with the Japanese in Korea. In fact, the Japanese had marched out into Manchuria and had briefly skirmished with some of the Manchu forces. Uh, and the Manchu chief, uh, Naruchi, actually offered the Ming to gather an army and invade Korea with them. But the Ming, fearing his power uh, is a threat, uh, refused. Which... I, it's hard. To, you know, of course, it's hard to say whether or not that was a good thing or a bad thing. But either way, regardless of whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, uh, the concern was not necessarily unwarranted. In fact, it was definitely not unwarranted because Narutai began to expand his uh, territory, conquering eastern Mongolia uh, and Korea during that period of time, during the 1630s, the same around the same time that the Ming were defeating the Dutch. Uh, and eventually they would declare war on the Ming Dynasty. Uh, and for a while, uh, this was sort of to a stalemate, because the at this point in time, the Qing, the uh, Manchu army was larger uh, and, and was more organized, but the Ming military they had better they had guns um, and better gun uh, they had not they had more guns and better guns uh and they had better fortific fortifications like the great wall however uh many Ming, Ming generals grew tired of the inadequacy of the Ming, uh and so they began to defect to the manchu forces with the most notable being wu song Wei, who opened his section of the Great Wall at the Shanghai Pass to the Manchu army. And so with that, at, uh, opening the, Shang, uh, the Shanghai Pass, the Manchu army was able to uh, march through to China and to take Beijing. Uh, forcing the, fling uh, the Ming court to flee south after Beijing was conquered in 1644. Uh, and for a time, uh, many the Ming, these Ming uh, offshoots, these Ming courts in exile, uh, were able to hold out. However, slowly but surely, from 1644 well into the 1660s, uh, the, uh, the Manchu military were able to uh, were able to you know, one by one conquer and subjugate all but one of these uh, of these Ming generals and Ming court officials. Uh, the the only one who was able to escape was the Ming general of Kozeng uh. So um, Kozeng uh, again from that video I talked about the Ming conflicts with European powers um, in greater detail. Uh, uh, was a powerful Ming general who, upon seeing essentially the writing on the wall, uh, was able to it, uh, decided to leave the Chinese mainland and invade uh, the island of Taiwan, which was held by the Dutch Empire at the time. Uh, it's, but he did this in 1661 CE, uh, and with his Ming army, he he was able to easily defeat the Dutch and take Taiwan for himself. Uh, and after doing so, he set himself up as essentially uh, a as a power he set himself up as a powerful warlord petty king, with his main areas of influence being Taiwan and these other areas in red, where he actually had his own military forces set up. Uh, but also his main areas of control, and then he had areas of influence here in the pink, far outside of the red, making him an incredibly powerful figure and an incredibly powerful enemy to the Qing dynasty. Uh, he also, at one point in time, shortly after his conquest of, uh, of Taiwan, thought about invading 
and in fact planned to invade the Spanish Philippines. And he gathered a very large army to do this, an army that was actually incredibly diverse. He had Ming soldiers, he had Dutch soldiers, he had uh, Japanese pirates, uh, basically you name it, and it was an incredibly well-trained, incredibly powerful uh, army. And in fact, he was such a threat to the Spanish Empire <laughs> that the Spanish Empire in the Philippines canceled all of their other battles and conquests. They were in the middle of several other wars with indigenous peoples in the Philippines, and they withdrew <laughs> all of their soldiers to the capital of the Philippines. And in fact, many historians uh, using this evidence and using the difference in military power between Cozinga's army and the Spanish army uh, are pretty sure that if he had actually invaded, Cozinga would have won. However, uh, the, shortly after he began making preparations to invade, Cozinga died of old age. Uh, uh, leaving it, uh, leaving the rule of Taiwan to his son uh, and his house, which would continue to rule for about 20 Taiwan for about 20 years until eventually the Qing dynasty was able to lead a massive armada uh, and defeated the House of Kozinga uh, at the Battle of, Ting, of Ping Hu, uh, capturing Taiwan and officially ending the last of the Ming dynasty holdouts in 1683 CE. So there you have it. There is the uh, long, complex history of the Ming dynasty and the History, the history of the Ming Dynasty's immense power over uh, the world, and how the Ming Dynasty, despite all its flaws and despite its decline in the last uh, in the last sixty years of its reign, uh, was very much the catalyst into bringing uh, China into the modern world, and really uh, several of the other countries surrounding it into the modern world. Uh, so I hope. So with that, I'm gonna end the movie, end the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you want to see me cover any of these other uh, any of the other subjects uh, I talked about in the movie in greater detail, uh, feel free to leave a comment. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed the movie, and remember to like, share, and subscribe. And I hope you all have a good day.